Hey guys. Well, it's the 5th of May. A little while later, I'm going to do some research and see what Cinco de Mayo really celebrates because I have the feeling as much fun as it is to celebrate, it's probably some kind of demonic holiday, which to them are holy days, not vacation days. Here's my girls. Oh, that's nice. Sorry about that. I was tuning in to Sadie as she was releasing pay dirt. <laughs> There's the little fire pit. It got uh, one of the logs got run over today. We got A delivery and my husband was trying to make room for it it's part of the tractor so we can mow the back wall on there because <laughs> it beats you up it is so because it stays wet so much the ruts are so deep I can't even get out there with the roller until it's almost dry and then it's too dry to roll out so Maybe if I can figure out how to hook up my little roller onto the back of this big old tractor that we've got, I can finally get it smoothed down to where it was. Although, like I said, that middle of that pasture has caved in about, or sunk in, about two feet since we've moved in here. So I'm not so sure that there aren't some kind of tunnels underneath our property. I wouldn't be the least bit surprised. And, you know, Battelle is close by, and they have underground facilities everywhere, so I don't know. I believe this property used to be used, or at least underneath it, used to be used for something nefarious. But I don't know for sure, so I really can't say. The reason that I am I was going to say, the reason I'm calling you today, the reason I'm making this video right now is before I got into the shower, I was looking on my computer and I found a dream that I had years ago. And it seemed really important. And then when I got out of the shower, the Lord was talking to me about it. So, you know, this, this video is going to be twofold. One, we're going to be talking about what the Lord was showing me in the dream, which is listening to the still small voice of God. And you know, sometimes the hardest part is being quiet and listening, not trying to talk to him but to listen to him. Because even now, as I'm trying to listen to his still small voice, I hear my voice. Quite a few years back, maybe about 15, 17, one day I was, was talking to the Lord and I said, Lord, is this you I hear? Or is it me? Am, is it my mind that's thinking up these things? And he said, do you really think you're that smart? I said, point taken, Lord. I totally understand. No, I am not. You know, sometimes you hear his voice so loud. In the stillness of your heart and your mind. That you think it's you. You think you're having a conversation with yourself and you're telling yourself things you want to hear. But I got news for you. When you have a relationship with Jesus, he's having that conversation with you. He told me one day, it's funny, it was right before church when we were allowed to go into the church buildings. Hi, your boys. And he said 
Ask me for everything that you need. Don't leave anything out. There's nothing too small to ask of me. He said, you're my beloved and my betrothed. And just like any fiance, I want to give you every good gift. And then I went to church and the pastor said, don't be wasting God's time asking him for the small things, which, you know, he's directly contradicting what God tells me in the morning. I know there's a problem with that pastor. But that's another story for a different day. So, you know, God wants to give you all of the desires of your heart if you're in relationship with him because you're his bride. I mean, don't be asking for mansions and stuff unless he really puts it on your heart that you need a mansion because he's preparing a mansion for each one of us in his father's house. And I'm willing to wait for that one. This ranch that he's given me is like a mansion. But I need grass seed for the orchard, or orchard seed for the pasture, pasture grass seed for the pasture. I need some kind of grass seed for the pasture. I need, to, I would love help to put in the drains, to drain the pasture and keep it drained, but we're only guessing. We don't really know. And we can't afford the five, six thousand dollars to have somebody come out and do it. So we're gonna try it ourselves. If anybody has expertise in this area, I would welcome a visit and some help. <laughs> Another thing the Lord was talking about me, or about to me in the shower was pulling people out of the fire. So I was listening to a YouTube video before I got in the shower, and it was a, a pastor that I've never seen before, and he was speaking truth. He was talking about how when Jesus died on the cross, he went to hell. He had to. He took all of our sins. He bore all of our sins on the cross. And he was saying how so many preachers and theologians and eschatologists and hermeneutics or hermeneutics or whatever they are will tell you that Jesus dying on the cross was, was being in hell. That was paying our penalty. It was not. It was not paying our penalty. Going to hell was our penalty, and he paid that. But while he was there, he took the keys to hell and to death, and he came out because he beat the devil by dying on that cross. And when I look at the book of Jude and it says to pull people out of the fire, you know, I just always imagine you know, people sitting around a big old campfire, like you see in all the Jesus movies and all the old Roman movies, they got those big old campfires, but that's not it. It's pulling them out of the fires of hell, hating the spots on their garment, the blood, the, the, the evil sacrifices and things that they've done. But I believe, and I definitely could be wrong because I have been wrong about many things in my life. But I believe that those people who had no choice, who grew up in that kind of lifestyle, 
I believe they're the ones. That he's talking about. Oh, sure, there's many others who have fallen face first into Satanism and witchcraft and <clears throat> because of the way they grew up, they were treated, they they were abused, they weren't raised, they were victimized, and then there's a coven out there, a cult out there saying, Come on, we'll love you, you'll be part of our family, we'll treat you good. And all you have to do once you get there is every evil thing that you never thought you'd do. And if you don't do it, well, then they're just like the people that victimized you growing up. Maybe even worse. Those are the people that he wants us to get, to pull out of the fire. People, even some of the people in politics who who went in innocent and were drugged and, and honeypotted or something even worse, were forced to do something at gunpoint and it was videotaped or photographed and held over their heads and they were blackmailed time after time after time. Those are the ones he wants us to pull out of the fire. And those people, those people have started to victimize their own children because that's how they were brought up. He wants us to pull them out of the fire. And oh my God, just think. If it had been any one of us who'd been born into that, and we were relying on somebody, somebody who would just tell us about Jesus and let us know that there is an option, there is salvation, there is forgiveness and hope in Jesus. We'd want them to do that for us. So we have to do that too. There are some people that we are not supposed to pray for. But there are some evil people that we are supposed to pray for because they're only evil because that's all they've ever known. See, I'm kind of fortunate in that Jesus, when he sends me to somebody who's been in witchcraft and Satanism or he puts me head to head against somebody who's been really evil, he sends me in with his love for them. And that's all I can see is his love for them. I feel that love in my heart for that person, for those people. And I pray. I mean, I'm telling you, we have to put ourselves sometimes between those people and Satan. And to do that, we have to know that Satan can't hurt us that we are clothed in majesty, that we are enrobed with the wings of our Father and our Savior, that we are filled with their Holy Spirit. He lives and breathes and has his being in us, and we live and breathe and have our being in him. I've heard some people out there who are apostles and prophets, or that's the titles that they've given themselves or that somebody else has given them. And they'll tell you, oh, you better not go fight that fight unless God tells you to because the devil will kick your butt. 
Well, you know, if you go back to the Seven Sons of Sceva, they got their butts kicked because they didn't have a relationship with Jesus. I mean, the demons said, you know, Paul we know, John we know, but we don't know who you are. And he beat the crap out of them. The demons had their way with those people because they did not know Jesus. Now, I don't know who I am in Jesus. I'm really a nobody. But I am everything that my Father says I am. I'm everything that my Savior says I am. And I am everything that the Holy Spirit of Yahweh says I am. And the word of God says, I have given you power over all of the powers and principalities of darkness, over all of the spiritual wickedness in the heavenlies, and nothing shall in any wise harm you. He's given us power to forgive sins. And he says, Whatso whosoever sins you remit on earth are remitted in heaven. Just like he told that, that paralyzed me and he said, your sins are forgiven. Take up your bed and walk. And of course, the Pharisees and Sadducees says, well, only God can forgive sins. And when God lives within you, he's given you that authority. You are a temple of God. And it's time to remember that. You need to stop smoking. You need to stop drinking excessively. <laughs> It'd be good if you could stop drinking altogether. And definitely don't vape. You're just allowing more metal particles into your lungs, which I'm sure interact with certain jabberuskis. But it's time. It's time to walk in what Christ has told you is your heritage. To put on the full armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the sword of the word of the Lord, the shield of faith, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel which means you have to read his word to know the power that he's given you. I mean, let this sink in. I have given you all power and authority over all of the powers and principalities of darkness and over all of the spiritual wickedness in the heavenlies. Do you understand what that means? Do you understand that... There are 777 books of the Bible that they took out. And if they left those in, imagine how powerful those 777 are. We are standing up in the ones we already know. And we are defeating Satan and his kingdom. It's not by power and it's not by might, but it's by his word that we are victorious. It's time, brothers and sisters. It is time. Stand up in all of his word. He said that he'll put his word in our hearts and in our minds. And he does. I'll tell you what, I can't find half of this stuff in the Bible when I'm looking for it. I know it's there because I've read it or I've heard it. I used to not get in the car without the Bible playing. I used to not sit around my house without the Bible playing or praise and worship playing. Now that my husband's working from home, it's a little more difficult because I would crank it up. You could hear it out in the streets. <laughs> 
but I know that it's his word because he's putting it in my heart, in my mind, and on my tongue. <clears throat> There's so much that he has for us. So much. A young lady asked me, ow, gee, sueys, that hurt. Asked me on True Social the other day for books that she should read. One of, one of the ones that I really think she needs to read, that we all need to read, is The Power of the Blood. The Power of the Blood of Jesus. His blood is so powerful. It washes away the sins of the world. It beat hell and death. And it's pulling all of us out of Satan's hands for all of eternity. It's given us power to cast out demons, to bind them up and cast them out. Power to say you're healed in the name of Jesus and you're healed. I've got books all over this house. Books in my bookshelf. I've got books in bins downstairs that I bought bookshelves for, but now that people are living down there, I don't have a way to put them out because it's all shoved back into the side so they can live down there for now. But there are so many books. Um, Mary Baxter, I think, I think it's Mary Baxter. Jeez, I don't want to tell you the wrong thing. Let's go look over here at the library a little bit. All right, let's see what we've got here. Oh, well, we got the missing books of the Bible. Uh, Bible Prophecy Handbook. Ooh, <laughs> this, this is one. The Crucified Ones. That's a good one. Charles Newbold. Now, he used to give these away. Thank God he did because I couldn't have afforded to buy them when I first got it. I couldn't afford anything when I first got it. And I got every single one of his books because they tell the truth. And there's Ultimate Favor. That's a good one. The Sword and the Split Switchblade. That's a good one, too, because that one... That one tells you about uh, about um, oh <laughs> these are good ones too. A power of your words, the gifts and ministry of the Holy Spirit. Uh, let's see, what's that one? Bible prophecy handbook. <gasps> oh, this book is an amazing book. I. Highly recommend you get it by Jim Corbett. I, I bought like 10 copies and given most of them away. His Presence in the Midst of You, that's another one by Mr. Newbold. Um, what's that one? Oh, here we go. The Transcendent Seed of Abraham, A People for Yahweh. Let's see what else I've got here. You know, just I have my some of my very favorites up close. Um, let's see, ultimate favor. Oh, if you want a good mystery book, Joel Rosenberg. Joel C. Rosenberg's a good author. Kept me enthralled for a long time. Um, more missing books of the Bible. Uh, get healthy and lose weight. Yep. Oh. And this one, uh, Dr. Berg, his son put out a scathing, scathing expose on him not too long ago that he is a, uh, uh, what is that? Uh, it's what, the divine intercessor, that's a good one too. Um, it's what, uh, oh. Uh, Carrie, what's her name? 
The Divine Revelation of Deliverance with Mary Kay Baxter. That's a really good one. Um, God's Medicine Bottle. That's a good one. Sorry about the photography, guys. You know, I'm, I don't know all this stuff. Derek Prince, you shall receive power. Uh, love languages. What's this one? Principalities and Powers, Lester Summerall. Um, what is this one? The Lost Bible, Forgotten Scriptures Revealed. Oh, raising your kids to the Lord. All right. That's enough for right now because that's a mess. But, um, uh-oh. Now they're falling. That's that's a good start. <laughs> you get going on those, and you'll be good. Oh, here's a good one, too. John Eckhart's How to Route Demons. Prayers that route demons. And the Holy Spirit Power by Charles Spurgeon. And... Angels and Demons Companion. Yeah, John Hagee did have some good stuff. A lot of these people wrote excellent books before they started going crazy. Um, so anyway, now I'm exhausted, so that's why I can't clean. <laughs> Every time I clean, I ransack the place again looking for things. So, thankfully, this is now my workshop and not my rec room. <clears throat> uh, Scientologist. That's, that's what Dr. Berg is. He's a Scientologist. And his son said he is a hardcore Scientologist and he gives a large portion of everything that he makes through the sale of his books and his videos and his YouTube videos and his supplements to the Church of Scientology. And he said just putting out that video put his life in danger and they would probably be coming after him. But Lord, I ask that you would protect that young man, keep him hidden from any harm in Jesus' name. So, that was a lot. <laughs> that was a whole lot. But the more we get into his word, and the more we ask him to put his word into us, to reveal his word to us, the more we're going to be like him. I had a dream once, decades ago, and I was standing with Jesus outside this this storefront, and it looked like it looked like a um, dry cleaner. And he opened the door for me, and he said, "Go get your clothes." And I looked, and I looked, and I looked. And everywhere I looked, I see all these, all these white clothes. And then, of course, there's, you know, some colored clothes. And I'm looking and he comes in and he says, why aren't you putting on your robes? I said, Jesus, I'm looking for the ones that are spotted with your blood. And he smiled at me. And he picked out one of the whitest ones and he said, this, this one is spotted with my blood. You're washed clean, white as snow, by my blood. This is your robe of righteousness. And 
And I'm crying right now thinking about it because when I was trying to take care of my mom and my world was falling apart and people were telling me that I had to stay in my house and I couldn't leave it to even mow the grass or take care of my animals because if something happened to my mom while I was outside of the house that I would be put in jail. Now my mom had her own house downstairs and I was not her caregiver. I was her daughter living in the house upstairs. She was my mom living in the house downstairs and they were supposed to take care of her. But ever since that day, I have felt like I let Jesus down. Because, you see, I raised myself from the time I was nine years old. My mom and my stepdad, they would get up at five o'clock in the morning and go to work at six at Avon, and then they'd get off at three and they'd go to the VFW, and they'd stay there all night until it closed. And then they'd come home and they'd start it all over again every day. So I learned to take care of myself. And then I learned to take care of my children and my husband. But I had never, ever learned to take care of another adult. I had never learned... to change the diaper of my mother until that time. And it was so hard. And on top of that, I was hurt. And I had to have physical therapy to walk again for the third time. And I felt like I let God down so badly. How could he still love me when I couldn't take care of my mom like she needed? I let him down. But just now I realized he washed me in his robes of righteousness. And he's not disappointed in me. Because when he died on that cross, he knew that I wouldn't be able to take care of my mom like she needed to be taken care of. He knew that I'd have to let her go to a nursing home, and he knew. He knew. So, I hope that this helps somebody else realize it's not their deeds. It's the blood of Jesus. It's his sacrifice. And it's your relationship with him. I was telling a brother the other day. I drove to pick my son up one day. And, and I was talking to the Lord. <laughs> we ha always had some of our best conversations in the car. <laughs> I was talking to him, and I asked him, I said, Lord, the birds and the animals, they do. They're born doing your will. They know where the food is, and they know how to build their home, and they're obedient to you to fly south if they have to fly south or fly north if they have to fly north. Why can't people be like that? And he said, because eternity is a very long time. And I only want to spend eternity with people who truly, truly love me. I don't want to spend eternity with people who would stab me in the back if they had the opportunity. I don't want to spend eternity with people who are evil. I don't want to spend eternity with people who would eat other people. I 
I want to spend eternity with people who choose me above all else. Even when times are hard, they choose me. Even if it would cost them their life, they would choose me, knowing, <clears throat> excuse me, knowing that even if it cost them their life, they will be alive with me for all eternity because they have faith in me and in my word. That's why man has free will. And so I realized through all of our using our free will, the most important thing we do is love Jesus no matter what. Just love Jesus with all our hearts and with all our souls and with all our minds, with all our body and all of our spirit. We love Jesus. I'm not saying we be perfect because we're human beings. We cannot be perfect because we're in imperfect bodies and we are in an imperfect world. But I do know that soon, and very soon, Jesus is going to show up and he's going to start his thousand year reign. And we're going to be like him. And I'm really excited for that. Because all I have to do is love him. I love him enough to do what he says and to walk in his word. He said... When I leave, I will send you the Comforter. That's the Holy Spirit, and He is here with us. He's in us. He gives us power. I remember one day my brother Brian called me from Oregon to tell me he needed prayer and I prayed and I prayed in the Holy Spirit now the things that my mom has said over the years since I was little have kind of stuck in me my grandfather Lemuel Michael Lemuel Edge he was one of the original the Kingsmen gospel quartet members he was also one of the original The Ambassadors Gospel Quartet. He had a, I think it was a Wednesday night radio show, and they would go and do concerts all over the place. And he built churches. He was a stonemason. And my uncle told me, when my grandma died, he said he would go work with his daddy. And he would sing, I'm building a house for my Lord. I'm building a house for my Lord. And he would just sing the whole time he built these churches. And he built houses for people in the church that he went to that couldn't afford houses. That's the kind of man my grandpa was. And then devil took him out at 41 with a heart attack because he smoked. He had a had a foot in the door. And that's how the devil got to my grandpa. You all got to be getting off the cigarettes. You understand? Get off of it now while you can. 
Well, that was a rabbit hole I went down. <clears throat> or as my husband calls it, I got squirreled. So, um, totally forgot where I was. <clears throat> I've gotten hooked on uh, iced coffee again. So I'm drinking a lot of it. And it's uh, making me cough. <sighs> Darn it. There was a real point to what I was saying, too. Well, anyway. Just really listen to the Word of God. And remember, you are the temple of God. And we need to pray for President Trump. For VP Kennedy, and for all the people that they love who love them, for all of their family and friends, and for everyone in their care and concern, because brothers and sisters, we are in their care and concern. I have seen the angels that are encamped round about President Trump and his wife Melania and his son Baron. There are some really big angels around that boy. And they're there because those people are on a mission from our Father to bring his kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I've seen him sitting on his throne. And I have seen Jesus sitting at his right hand. And I have stood before them and sang worship to them. And I know that one minute in their presence is worth everything that we go through to get there. One minute. It says one day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. We'll be there with the people that we love in his presence one day. And even those who have died hundreds of years before us, for them it will be just as one moment. All of the little aborted babies will be there. They're, they're in God's presence day and night. All of the miscarried babies, they're there. They're just waiting for their moms and dads to get there. And they're still just going to be little babies. Heaven is real, guys. I've seen it. I've stood in his presence. I've sat on his lap. It's real. It's so real. It's so real. Well, that better be it for today. God bless you all. In Jesus' name, I ask that each one of you that listen to this have a new understanding of Jesus a refreshing infilling of the Holy Spirit to overflowing. Oh, something I need to tell you that the Lord showed me again last night. Decades ago, I had a vision that I was in this room. And you know how there's, there's the storage shelves at the grocery store. There were like six shelves, five or six shelves on each one. And there were three of them shaped like in a U shape. And I was standing there and there was one can 
on the shelf. And I took the can and I handed it out. And I didn't even see who I handed it out to. And as I did, I looked back at the shelf thinking, well, now there's nothing left. And I see five cans. And I take those and I start handing them out to people that are suddenly lining up by the by the shelves. And as I give them out, there's like 10 times as much. Every time I give one out, 10 more. Every time I give one out, soon all of the shelves are just, they're just stacked with cans. And the Lord said, the more you give out, the more you'll receive back to give out more. Give freely and you will receive. His word says, freely you have received, freely give. So every day, tell somebody something about Jesus. If you can give somebody food that's hungry, give them food. If you can give somebody clothes because they they don't have any or, or they need some, give them the clothes. Everything that you give out in love, God God will return to you a hundredfold in one way or another. If you see a brother or sister in need, give them what they need. Don't say be you warm and filled and not help them if you can help them. If not for the people who helped me when I was living in my car after my divorce, or the neighbors, the neighbor's little girl would fix a plate of dinner for me so that when I came back to her house after her family ate, she would feed me because she knew there was no food in my house and nobody would be coming to feed me. She was an amazing friend. And now she has her own veterinarian hospital. And she's just an amazing person. If not for Mary, I would have starved. And I'm grateful. And I know everyone has a story like that at some point in their life. And those are the ones that God can use the most because we've been there and we know We know what it's like to be abused. We know what it's like to be neglected. We know what it's like to be hungry. We know what it's like to be outcast, cast aside. You know, not everybody needs money. Some people just need company. Some people just need food. Some people need prayer. Some people just need somebody to talk to. You know, the coolest thing that I've been able to do is to pay for somebody's electric so that their electric wasn't turned off. Or pay for their gas. So the gas wasn't paid off. I didn't give them money. I went right to the gas company and I paid. I went right to the electric company and paid. Everybody needs some help sometimes. We don't know what anyone is going through. You can't tell by looking at the outside of somebody what they've been through. But you can ask Jesus what you can do for everyone that you come across.
and God takes care of you. I know I've been down to four cents in my bank account more times than I can count over the years, especially since we've moved here. And they killed my mom because she was supposed to pay half the rent or half the mortgage. And she was supposed to live until Jesus came back because my grandma lived to 93 well, three weeks short of 93. And my mom was supposed to live that long. But she didn't. Because the doctor gave her a drug that she wasn't supposed to have for something that he was not supposed to be giving her a drug for. And it blew up her brain four days later. And... She only lived two years after that in dementia and it was so sad it was so sad may God bless you all have a wonderful day and remember There are very few people in this world who are not the walking wounded. You need to treat everybody like they're somebody special to Jesus because he died for us all except the son of perdition. I guess the sons of perdition. <laughs> God bless you all. Have a wonderful day. Bye.